hope that summer has been, uh, it's off to a good start for every single one of you. We're in this endless summer series, and I don't know if you guys have a favorite season, but I know that I have a favorite season. And I don't want to give away mine just yet. I kind of, you, you, may, you may already know, all right, that's what pastor's favorite season is. But I want to find out on the count of three, I want you to yell as loud as you can across all campuses your favorite season, okay? Winter, spring, summer, fall. One of those four. On the count of three, let's just size up this place and figure out what you guys like on three. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Okay, I got, definitely got some summer, lots of summer. I got a little bit of fall in there. Uh, I didn't know that I heard any like winters or springs. So here's my thing. All right, winter, let's talk about it for a second. Winter is just too cold. This most, of, come on, we all left the frozen north to move away from that. Get that mess out of here. Yeah, nobody, nobody wants that. Spring is too wet, too wet. Fall's too pumpkin spice, okay? It's just... You know, I can already picture the Ugg boots and pumpkin spice. No. So I'm a summer guy, okay? I love summer. Summer's perfect. And I get that it's hot, but, but hello, we live at the beach, okay? I, I love summer. It's my favorite. It seems as if, and maybe, it's, maybe I feel this way because I remember being a kid and like you just couldn't wait for summer. School was letting out for summer. But it feels like we endure the rest of the year so that we can enjoy summer. That's just what it feels like to me. It feels like summer just kind of slows down a little bit. And I love that. You know, in the words of DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, summer, summer, summertime, time to sit back and unwind. Don't you love a little bit of unwinding? Like the days are longer. Life moves a little slower. And there's a ton of summer songs. There's not really hardly any fall songs. Don Henley. The Boys of Summer, or maybe the younger generation, you know, the Ataris, they kind of took that. I don't know what your favorite is, but Ella Fitzgerald, summertime, and the living is easy. It just is. It just is. All right, younger folks, Chance the Rapper, maybe a little Death Cab collab. Do you remember how when you were younger, all the summers lasted forever? They did when you were younger. Thomas Rhett says, slow down summer. Or the greatest summer anthem of all time by Brian Adams. Come on, the summer seemed to last forever. A little summer of 69. Just epic. Nobody's writing songs about all these other seasons. And of course, for my non-summer people, I got songs for you. A little summertime sadness, if that's your vibe. It's not mine. <laughs> cruel, cruel summer. So you can have yours. I just love summer. It feels like there's more fun, a little more freedom, which makes me wonder. I got thinking about this. Why is it that we, we find more fun and freedom in summer and less the rest of the year? Got me, uh, reminded me of a, of a quote. I don't know if you're familiar with Seth Godin. He does a lot of marketing and leadership. And he tells a story about being on vacation one time. And so he had unplugged, went on vacation, and uh, he had this one, one, one project he had to attend to. He said it, it took literally minutes. So he leaves the resort area, goes into the, uh, or leaves the beach area, goes into the lobby of the resort, opens his laptop, and he overhears somebody say, look at that poor guy. He can't even get away from his work on vacation. And he said it kind of offended him because he uh, he knew he had to do this one thing. He said he's never a slave to the job, but he, he said something that stuck with me when I heard it. He said, how about instead of wondering when your next vacation is, Maybe you should set up a life that you don't need to escape from. And I was like, wow, I love that. Now I got nothing against vacation, all right? I'm about to get mine. I love vacation. I think you should vacation. I think we should vacation more. But what good is a vacation if it's a one-week retreat from a life that you don't like? And so I submit to you that we can experience all of the joy, the thrill, the fun of summer all year long. That's what this idea of endless summer is. It's living a life that needs no retreat. And so today, I want to give you permission to have more fun. That's, if I have one goal today, it's that you walk out of here going, I got to have more fun in my life. I got to have some fun. And uh, I want you to just not have fun in the summer, but I want you to sprinkle it all through those other seasons so that it's not just a summer of fun. Man, it's a life of fun. But I know some of you need some convincing of this. You're like, wait a, wait a minute, where does it say that in the Bible? So I'm going to preach a message today that I have titled, I encourage you to take notes, I titled this, A Theology of Fun. 
a theology of fun. I just know some of you need a little bit of convincing to have some fun in this life. So think about it. What is a theology? Theology is the study of God. So if a theology of fun, if, a, if theology is the study of God, theology of fun is the study of fun through the lens of God's word. Okay, we're gonna look at God's word. We're gonna, we're gonna come up with a theology of fun because let's be honest, when was the last time you sat through a sermon telling you that you need to have more fun? Never. Most of the time you get guilted for having too much fun. You're like, well man, I feel like I shouldn't have gone on that vacation. I shouldn't have had fun. But I need you to know here at LifePoint, we really have a value of fun. It's actually one of our 10 values. We say it like this, we take fun seriously. We take fun seriously. Write that down in your notes. We take fun seriously. Some of the things we do around this church, if you're looking for the spiritual value, you'll miss it. We just think life should be enjoyed. Matter of fact, I mean, we, we believe in working hard and playing hard. This week, with our Love Thy Neighbor, if you're not signed up for a Love Thy Neighborhood project, there's a card when you came in, there's a QR code, scan it. There's over 50 projects. We're gonna be packing, we're gonna be packing 20,000 meals today. That's awesome. So we're gonna work hard, but then on Saturday the 16th, it's coming Saturday, we're gonna party. We've got celebrations, after parties at every campus. So if you're like, well, I just have no fun in my life, that's on you. We have given you the opportunity. We want you a part of this. So sign up, look for these things so that we can work hard and we can play hard. But when I look at scripture, when I go to God's word, which, which for me, this is my authority on everything. When I look at scripture, I can't help but think that God created us for fun. I wanna try, to, try my best to prove it to you today. So theology of fun, let's talk about this. I'm gonna give you six thoughts about God, his word, and life to give you permission to go and have more fun. The first is this, write this down. Everything God creates is good. Would you write that down? Now, I'm gonna tell you to write stuff down. In the past, the last series we finished up, I wanted everybody in their Bibles. If you're good at finding places in your Bible, by all means, go for it. Today, you're gonna be better served writing down the, the Bible references that I give you and looking them up later. But I need you to know, if we're gonna develop a theology of fun, we have to begin with the idea that everything God creates is good. It is. Let me show you in Genesis chapter one. Feel free to turn to this one. This one's pretty easy to find. If you've got a LifePoint Bible, it's on page two. Page two. So in Genesis chapter one, verse 31, God has been in creation mode. I mean, you know, sun, moon, stars, everything. And he says, it's good, it's good, it's good. And when he wraps it all up, Genesis 1 verse 31, the Bible says God saw all that he had made and it was very what? Say it with me. It was very good. One more time. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. So God looks around and everything he made is very good. When was the last time you just stopped to look at creation for just a minute? You just took in to account everything that God created. When was the last time you went out and just watched a, a sunset for, for a moment and were like, man, look at that. Look at those colors. Like, God did not settle for the Crayola 12-pack when he created the world. Can we agree on that? Remember when you went to elementary school and your mom had to send you with crayons and you showed up with the 12-pack and your friend had the super mega 375 crayons with a sharpener on the back? You were embarrassed to pull your little 12-pack out. You're like, I got red. I got the primary colors. And they got made up color names. You ever just sat and just looked like, wow, God, look at, I don't even know that there's a name for that color and you used it. That's amazing. Or have you ever just looked at different parts of the world? You saw like the color of the water and you were like, wow, I've never seen it so blue. Well, God did that and he was like, it's very good. And you're like, yeah, it's really good. Or how about this? You ever looked at some of the animals that God made and you were like, God is definitely, he's definitely got a sense of humor when he made some of these. I mean, there's some wild things out there. I got a picture of just a few of my favorite. Uh, let's start with the duck-billed platypus. Look at this guy. You know God was like just waiting for Adam to find this one. He's like, what do you name that one? He's like, it's a duck. No, it's a platypus. It's a, what is it? God's like, I don't know. You come up with a name, duck-billed platypus. Adam could have used a creative team. But, I mean, that's awesome. How about this, a galagos, also known as a bush baby. Right? You want one. You're like, where do I buy that at? I don't know. But that's awesome. 
And then this last one, I don't even know that I'm going to say it right, an axle. Look at him, he's just smiling. You look at that and tell me we got a boring God. No way. No way. I need you to know that if we're going to develop a theology of fun, we've got to begin with the concept that everything that God creates is good. What else did God create? He created you. He created you. And he didn't mess up. He didn't make a mistake. He made you on purpose, and you are good. I need you to know this. So if we're going to develop a theology of fun, we start there. Everything God creates is good. And then we've got to move on to number two. Write this down. God delights. As simple as that, God delights. And this is gonna shatter some of our perceptions of God because for some of you, God is this like crotchety old guy. He's irritated everything. Get off my lawn. Change your hair. You're not going out looking like that. We just think that God has just got like permanent stank face. And we disappoint him. But can I tell you, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God creates and he delights in his creation. He delights in his children. Moms and dads, you ever just looked at your kids, they just cracked you up. You were like, they, they got that from their mother is what you would always say. Like running around like a bucket on their head, <laughs> just like their mom. But you laughed. Or, or, or if you have multiple kids, have you ever walked in and you saw your kids playing nicely together and it was like it brought a tear to your eye? This is so, this is so good. Guys, my three kids, they're out of the house right now. And so when we got together as a family, it hits different. Time together with your kids, man, it's special. And we delight in them. Do they still get on our nerves? For sure. Because that's their job. But as parents, we love them. We love them. Let me show you in Psalm 149, verse 4. Psalm 149, verse 4 says, For the Lord takes delight in his people. Some of you, you need to highlight that in your Bible because you got this idea that God tolerates you and he can't stand you. And maybe you were even told that you were not even, like we didn't want you, we didn't plan for you. Maybe you were like, huh, you were an oops, slipped one past the goalie. You, we and so you've lived, <laughs> you've lived your whole life with this idea that you were a mistake. Can I tell you, the Lord delights in you. And get that in your soul. You're not a disappointment. You're a delight. He delights in you. If you look at Psalm chapter 18, we've been learning about King David and Saul. And when Saul was chasing and attacking King David, David writes in Psalm 18 verse 19 that God comes to his rescue. Look at these words. It says, he, God, rescued me because he delighted in me. Hold on, God, you, you rescued, you delivered me because you delight in me. To delight in means to take pleasure in. Some of you need to, need to accept the fact that God delights in you. He takes pleasure in you. You're not an inconvenience to God. So if we're gonna develop this theology of fun, we've gotta start with everything God creates is good. God delights. He delights. Here's number three, write this down. God created laughter. What a gift. God created laughter. Now let me just ask, when was the last time you laughed so hard you couldn't pull it back together? You were just one of those, like you just, you are, you are just dismantled laughing so hard. It happened for me just a couple weeks back. We, when we were doing our Binge the Bible series, we would film these bonus features and they were not very scripted and we got off the rails one time. We got on a track we couldn't get off and we were dying, laughing so hard. Tears are falling out of our face and every time we tried to regain composure, we fell apart again. And can I tell you, it was so good to just laugh, to smile. They say it takes 43 muscles to frown but only 17 muscles to smile. Some of y'all working way too hard right now. You were like, you are working out. You quit using 43 and just go with 17. Just laughter and a smile. God created our bodies with emotions and emotional responses. And one of those happens to be just outbursts of laughter. James Martin, he's a priest and author. He wrote this. He says, joy, humor, and laughter should be part of everyone's spiritual life. Some of you never felt like that was very spiritual to laugh. Well, he says it should be part of your spiritual life. They are gifts from God, and they help us enjoy creation. 
God has gifted us with laughter. The Bible even says, Proverbs 17, 22, says that a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Now we know what it feels like to have a crushed spirit. We've all dealt with difficulty. I mean, these last couple years have felt like one crushing after another. So we get the crushed part, but the prescription for that is that we need a cheerful heart. I love it. I just picture God writing up a prescription. You need to go laugh a little bit. You need to enjoy life a little bit. You know, why so serious all the time? A cheerful heart is good medicine. Now, here's what's really cool. I love that God said this a really long time ago. WebMD backs it up and says that laughter improves blood flow, strengthens the immune system, lowers blood sugar levels, and improves relaxation and sleep. Could I give you a prescription today to go and find something to laugh about? To just be okay to let your hair down and have a good time. Like, I love when science discovers something that God told us like a long time ago. I think about in the Bible moments of laughter. I think about when uh, we learned about Abraham and Sarah and how God promised them a child and he'd be the father of many nations, but they were old and childless. And we're told that at the age of 90, Sarah becomes pregnant. That's crazy. And I mean, Abraham's 100 She's 90, Genesis 21, verse six. Sarah says this. She says, God has brought me laughter. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. You imagine everywhere she was just pushing in her little up a baby stroller. And everybody's like, is this your great grandkid? She's like, nope, it's mine. Your grandkid? No, it's my kid. You know, everybody was laughing. It says, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. I love that she attached this blessing of God to Laughter. How about this, Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse four, is written by the wisest man ever. He says this, he says, there is a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And some of you just discovered that that comes from the Bible. You were like, that's footloose, isn't it? That was Kevin Bacon, wasn't it? No, that's in the Bible. There's a time for all of those things. And I need you to know, laughter is a gift from God, God created it. So everything he makes is good, God delights. He gives us laughter, it is this gift. Here's number four, write this down. We are told, we are commanded to worship with gladness. Worship with gladness. Now there's a lot of different expressions of worship. Some of them are quiet and they're more contemplative, but many of them are loud, they're joyful, they're celebratory. Psalm 100 verse two. It says, worship the Lord with gladness and come before him with joyful songs. Maybe you're new to Life Point and you're like, man, people next to me, they kept clapping. And this guy kept raising his hands and this one shouted hallelujah at some point. And you're like, what is going on here? We believe that church should be a pep rally. I believe, I mean, clapping, <laughs> clapping, shouting, dancing. Now we'll admit, okay, sometimes clapping's tough because some of us are rhythmically challenged. So we're with you until we start singing, and then it's like, yeah, whatever, I'm gonna move on. Raising our hands, the expressive nature of it, shouting to a God who's worthy, even dancing. I love to hear Pine Valley. We had a little groove going for a moment there, a little side to side, didn't we? Some of you were like, I can't dance in church. That goes against my beliefs. And uh, no, we had a little groove. You're allowed to dance in church, and you can even take it beyond this. I know you don't have a lot of space, but you can throw a little, 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 you know, little hips and arms. You're like, oh, they're moving their hips. The devil's in the hips. No, get you. it's okay to move a little bit. You know, you can get a little jump going. If you're not perspiring, you're not worshiping yet. We should get excited. Now, I'm not saying you ought to like, you know, hit the cabbage patch or anything. Be like, what is that? <laughs> Go God. Go, God, sprinkler, you know, the shopping cart, the shop. I'm not saying you need to go through your whole repertoire. But for crying out loud, does God deserve our celebration? Yes. Yes. I know it's messing with your theology, but I'm, this is not a funeral, guys. The tomb is empty. He deserves worship, and he demands worship. So let's bring it. Yeah, let's not, let's not, man, let's, let's be excited. I just think about it being a pep rally. Like you've been celebrating and worshiping all week and I'm celebrating and worshiping and you're celebrating in Pine Valley or Porter's Neck and CB and, and online. And then we all get together and we're like, y'all better give me some space. They need to spread these chairs out because I'm about to worship. I'm about to worship. I love that. 
The church should be alive and full of life. Number five, number five, two more. The fifth is this. God commanded his people to celebrate. Celebrating is a command. We've been learning about the Old Testament and in Leviticus, God gave them seven feasts and festivals to celebrate. They were not suggestions, they were commands. You will take time and you will celebrate because I don't want you to forget what I've done and who I am. And some of these would last upwards of a week. Could you imagine? We're just guys, we're gonna celebrate for a week and they would party. It would be like spring break without the regret. Be so good. Just celebrate. How about this? Do we got any, anybody like you, newlyweds, like maybe two years and under? Raise your hand. Two years and under. Raise your hand across all of our kids. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. All right. And she was raising his hand back there. She's like, honey, put it up. He's like, I don't remember how many years it's been. Check this out. Imagine this. Here's a command from God. Deuteronomy 24. If a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him for one year. He is to be free to stay at home and bring happiness to the, to the wife he has married. That's the Lord. Can you imagine you're like, I'm gonna need to take the next year off because uh, God wants me to bring some happiness to my wife. I just love that God commands celebration. It should be a part of our life. And here's the sixth and final. Jesus was fun to be around. Read the stories. Jesus was fun to be around. Like, my Jesus likes to party. His first miracle happened at one. One of the things my wife and I have started doing recently, we started watching the show The Chosen. I don't know if any of you guys have seen this yet. Yeah, okay, yes. It's awesome. It puts some personality on the stories that many of us have read for our entire life. And you see Jesus as a guy. You see him as a guy that laughs and a guy that, that cuts up and a guy that, that you know, yeah, there's the, there, there's the weeping and there's the, there, there's the stern and there's all of that, but, he's, but he has emotions of laughter and joy as well. And you get to see him showing up. I mean, he, he got invited to parties. Like my Jesus got invited to parties. Very first miracle turned water into wine. And it was not the cheap stuff. It was the good stuff, the good wine. He got accused of hanging out with misfits and outcasts because he went to dinner parties. He got invited to them and he showed up. Here's what I can tell you. If you've ever thrown a party, there are people you did not want to invite. Am I right? There are fuddy-duddies that you're like, should we invite them? You're like, no. Don't invite them. Just don't post about it on social media. That way they won't know they, they weren't invited. Some of you were like, does that happen? Yeah, you're probably the one that doesn't get invited. <laughs> Sorry to be the one to break it to you. But you get to choose whether or not you're going to be the kind of person that gets invited. The Bible tells us that Jesus, he had a value of celebration, a value of fun. Luke chapter 15, I don't have time to go to, to read those stories. But in Luke chapter 15, we're given an incredible glimpse into the heart of God. And Jesus says, let me, let me help you explain the heart of God. And he tells three stories. First story is about a shepherd who's got 100 sheep counts him up at the end of the night, he's only got 99, he's missing one. Well, he's not gonna let the one go, he leaves the 99 in a safe place, he goes after the one, he gets the one, he brings it back home, and what does he do? He says he calls all of his friends and he throws a party. Let's celebrate. Then he tells a story about a woman who's got 10 coins and she loses one. These are valuable coins. She loses one, says that she tears the house apart. I mean, she's lifted up the furniture, she's sweeping everything, she finds it, she calls her friends, she throws a party. She says, let's celebrate. Then he ends the story with a father who has two sons and the younger son does the unthinkable. He says, dad, give me my inheritance, which in essence is like saying, I wish you were dead. So give me mine so that I can go live the life that I want. Son does it, lives it up, has a blast. The money runs out, famine sets in and he's like, I gotta go home. And he makes the walk of shame back home. But when his father sees him and he wraps him up, he restores him, guess what he does? He throws a party. And he celebrates. Guys, Jesus emphasized celebration. Here's another thought. Kids wanted to be around Jesus. I can tell you, kids don't want to be around people that are boring. Parents would bring their kids to Jesus to bless them. The disciples are like, no, no, get those kids out of here. He didn't have time for that. And what did he say? He said, no, let the, let the kids come to me. He wanted to bless them. The kids wanted to be around Jesus. And then Jesus just simply said, I've come to bring life. He said, there's a thief in this world that wants to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. 
And some of us are like, yeah, we'll get that full life in heaven. I believe he wants you to have full life now, today. But we've got to get through our heads like it's okay to celebrate and enjoy. And maybe you're like, Pastor, why is this such a big deal? Here's why I believe it's a big deal. Because the more I look around, I see a whole bunch of Christians enduring what we should be enjoying. We've accepted that this life is something to be endured. we got to stick it out. You know, Beulah Land will be with the Lord in Beulah Land. And we're like, where is Beulah Land anyway? The sweet by and by. We have songs about heaven, and we should. But I believe that we're called overcomers. I believe this life should be enjoyed. It's as if we take our Bibles and we highlight all the verses about suffering, persecution, pain, trials. And we overlook the ones that have to do with gladness, joy, laughter, and fun. Now, quick disclaimer, I want to be, be honest before you. Does our faith come with hardships? Yes. Do we experience the tension and conflict and, and sorrow? Yes, absolutely. Do broken hearts and, and do tearful eyes reflect the heart of God? Yes. We've already looked at the Bible telling us in Ecclesiastes that there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to to mourn and a time to dance. My concern is that somehow we find weeping and mourning more holy than the practices of laughing and dancing. And I want you to know that this is a gift of the Lord. And here's where it became a real issue for me. Several years ago, I had been working through this idea. And I, I mean, I love my life. I love my wife. I love my family. I love our church. I love the staff I get to work with. I love my city. I love this area that I live in. But something was missing in my life. I was at Mission Barbecue, and I had two of my close friends with me. And we were just kind of casually talking like guys do. And I said, let me ask you guys a question. When was the last time you had fun? And we all kind of looked around like, when was the last time you had fun? And the more we sat there, we were like, what? When did it stop being fun? Like, I came home, I asked my wife, I said, when was the last time you just had fun? I started asking the people that were close to me. And here's what I learned, is that if we aren't careful, somewhere along the lines, the fun stops. We stop having fun because there's work to be done, life is too serious, there's another crisis, another tragedy, another thing, and we stop having fun. Fun, and I did that in my life, and chances are you've probably done that at some point, maybe even right now in your life. Because here's what I know about me. I used to be a ton of fun. You guys ever look at your life and you're like, I used to be a good time. I did, and I don't know, maybe it was the job, and that took it from you. Maybe it was the kids, and you're like, oh, I used to have fun before kids. Maybe it was, you know, the promotion, the obligations. Now I got bills, I got stuff. When did I become a fuddy-duddy? I think I'm a good time. I used to go surfing, I used to play golf, I used to get invited to places. You ever been there? As Christians, I believe we ought to be setting the pace when it comes to enjoying this life. I like what Pastor Rick Warren says. He says there's many people who do not want to let God into their lives because they fear God will make them give up anything that's fun. In other words, they think that to become a Christian is the same as saying the party's over, that to be spiritual is to be miserable. Last time I checked, Jesus attended parties and God throws them. Can I tell you, we ought to be on the front lines. People ought to be like, I don't know about you, man. There's something about you. You just seem like you enjoy this life. I want to be the kind of person that wrings every drop of joy out of this life. Let me ask you, when was the last time you had just good, clean fun? When was the last time you laughed so hard you wet yourself just a little bit? <laughs> now, some of you are like, that's not real hard anymore. That's a... <laughs> when was the last time you had so much fun you lost track of the time? We've all been in the situations where you look at your watch and you're like, how's it only been 10 minutes? But then you've had times where you, you look and you're like, it's been three hours. Yeah, time flies when you're having fun. I used to tell myself, yeah, we'll, get, we'll, we'll do some of these things that I enjoy when we get, you know, a newer house or a, a bigger house. And then five years ago, my wife and I, we got a newer to us and a bigger house. And guess what? We still didn't do the things that we didn't think we could do when our house was too small. It has nothing to do with the things that we have. We have a tendency to put off until later what we need to put on right now. 
we have a tendency to put off till later what we need to put on right now. There's no time like the present. And here's what you, here's what you don't know. You don't know about tomorrow. The Bible says life is but a vapor. It's a mist and then it's gone. So my question is this. You may even want to write this in your notes. What have you been putting off that you need to put on? What have you been putting off that you need to put on? For some of you, you need to, you need to put a party on. You need to throw a party. You came to church today for your pastor to tell you that you need to throw a party. Schedule it. Stop doing like us guys do. Us guys, we get around each other, we're like, man, what's good? What hell, we need, we need to get together. I think it just sounded like I said a bad word. And what I said was, hey, oh, we need to get together. <laughs> I'm so glad we get to practice the principle of laughter. <laughs> I was hearing back what I said and, hey, oh, we need to get together. <laughs> so, you're like, well, the last time I laughed really hard and wet myself was at church. <laughs> but isn't it true, us guys, at least, ladies, you're probably better in this world, like, let's get together, and then six months later, hey, let's get together, and then six months later, just schedule it. Put it on the calendar. We're going to get together. Maybe it's a movie night. Come over to the house. We're going we're gonna to do a movie night. We're going to get together. Maybe it's a day at the beach. We're just going to go. We're going to spend some time at the beach. Maybe I'm going to schedule a tea time. I'm going to find three friends. And we're going to go. We're going to go, you know, lunch with the ladies. We'll watch the sunrise, the sunset. Let's have a pool day. Let's go for a hike. Let's order some ice cream. Let's throw a barbecue. Let's go play putt-putt. Let's go play disc golf. Just put it out there. You know, in the last few weeks, I, I, uh, I told you I do love my life, and I do have some pretty amazing friends. And I got thinking, just in the last few weeks, man, I've been so blessed. I have uh, my, my old small group, we haven't been together in a while. We, we were like, let's get the gang back together. And we got the small group together for dinner and fireworks down at Carolina Beach. And we just caught up and had an amazing time. Got to go with my staff and watch a movie. We watched Maverick and I almost wanted to grow a mustache. <laughs> my wife and I took a date night. We went and played putt-putt. Hole number one, her first hit, hole in one. She destroyed me. Destroyed me. I will have vengeance in this life or the next Sat by a fire pit with friends. Went out and spent time at the beach. Didn't even want to do this next one. I was about 7.30. I was winding down. And my son calls. He was in town last week. And he's like, Dad, we're going to do something awesome. You want to go have a scavenger hunt? I was like, no, I don't want to have a scavenger hunt. It's 7.30 p.m. He's like, yeah, we'll start at 8.30. I'm like, I go to bed at like 9, 9.30. Because I'm a fuddy-duddy now. And I don't want to do it. And the weather wasn't good. And we're like, all right, fine, we're in. He doesn't ask for a whole lot. So we went down and had an incredible time scavenger hunt all over Carolina Beach. Now some of you were like, well, aren't you special? Look at you with all this fun stuff. All right, lest you think that I just have this crazy social life, I just said I go to bed at like 9 or 9.30. But here's what I've learned. Now some of those I got invited, others I, I initiated. I said, hey guys, let's, let's get together. You can either wait for an invite or you can give one. And so as a church, we've gone ahead. We've just made it happen for you. So this week, we've got Love Thy Neighborhood. Guess what? There are projects happening every single day. Your homework is to find your friends, pick a project, sign up for it, and show up. And if you're like, well, man, I'm new to the area and I don't have any friends, good. Your homework is pick a project, sign up, show up, and make some friends. It's the best thing to do because when you get older, it's hard to make friends, isn't it? Somebody's nice to you and you wonder what their angle is. Like, I don't know, they complimented my... My, my outfit, I don't, know what I don't know what they're trying to, just go serve alongside each other, bless our community, make friends in the, in the process. You can scan the little QR code or go on the website. So here's your homework. Homework is first, pick a project, serve with friends. Just do it, you'll be so glad you did it. It'll fill you up. The second is this, do one thing this week just for fun. Now it may take some time to think, what did I used to do for fun? Some of you need to make a tea time. Some of you need to schedule a tea time for your husband or for your wife. Just say, look, I went ahead, I, I made it, I scheduled it, I want you to do this. As a family, here's an idea. When our kids were younger, we'd have, you know, all these ideas, and some cost money and some didn't, and we'd write them on strips of paper, and we'd fill a jar, and then once a week, we'd pull one out of the jar, and that's what we did. Unless we really didn't like it, and then we didn't tell the kids what it was, and we stuck it back and got another one, but <laughs> just a way to keep it fresh. When my boys were younger, when my kids were younger, boys, you know, our whole family, we, we started what we called Man Movie Monday. It's exactly what it sounds like. We would gather on the couch and I would introduce my family to the classics, the man movies. It was, you know, Rambo and Rocky and all things Stallone. And yeah, take it, steal it. We had Wacky Food Wednesday. Everybody picks one thing. We bring it all together. We had, we had crab legs and waffles one time. 
I mean, chicken and waffles started somewhere. But just, just, you just, just make stuff up and enjoy. That's the stuff you're going you're gonna to enjoy. You're going to remember as a family. You know, couples, put a date night. Find somebody to watch the kids. Throw a party for no reason. We're just going to throw a summer party. That's it. Because this life needs to be enjoyed. One last verse. I'll close with this. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. The apostle Paul speaking to his son in the faith. He says, command those who are rich in this present world unless you tune me out. And you're like, well, he's not talking to me. If you are listening to this sermon and you live in this country, we are the wealthiest people in the world. He's speaking to you. You are rich in this present world. He says, don't be arrogant. Don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Lord knows that's the truth right now. But put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our what? Say it with me, for our enjoyment. God has blessed you for your enjoyment. He wants you to enjoy. God wants us to enjoy what he's given us. And while I can't make summer all year, we can steal some of that joy of summer and begin to spread it through winter and spring and fall. And listen, tough times are gonna come, it's life. Jesus said in this life, you will face troubles, but take heart because I've overcome the world. You will face difficult times. There will be seasons where you have to endure, but I believe this is a life that we should enjoy. And so I wanna give you a moment as we close together today. I wanna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I wanna ask you if you'd pray with me. And just as we begin to bow our heads, I wanna ask you like I always do, what is God saying to you right now? Is there something, maybe there was just something that, that you felt like the Lord was like, yeah, that, that's why I brought you here. That's why you're watching this feed. That's why you're at church today. Is there something that, that I think the Holy Spirit is, is pushing into your heart that we would enjoy, that we would make the most of this gift of life that God has given us? Maybe today it's just the fact that your perception of God has been shattered and you just thought God was just a killjoy. But instead, he's actually the author of joy. Can I tell you, the Bible tells us that God so loves you that he sent his one and only son to the cross. When we talk about the cross, it, that, was a, that was a horrible moment. That was the death of Jesus. His body was broken, was placed in a tomb. But the story didn't stop there. If the story stopped there, yeah, we would be downcast and we would be mournful, but it doesn't stop. It says that on the third day he rose again, he conquered sin death and the grave and the Bible tells us that if we put our faith and our trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we too will overcome. We too have an eternity in heaven and we too experience joy here and now. And so if you've never made this decision to put your trust in Jesus, I wanna give you that opportunity with heads bowed and eyes closed. I wanna pray for you and I'm gonna ask you to make this your prayer from your heart to the very heart of God. It goes like this. You don't need to pray it out loud, but from your heart with sincerity, would you say, dear God, just in the quietness of your heart, dear God, thank you for loving me. I repent of my sin right now. I put my faith in Jesus. I give you my life. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change me today. Help me to live for you. Help me to enjoy this gift of life. Now for just another 20 or 30 seconds with heads bowed, if today you join me in that moment, you prayed that prayer with me, I wanna celebrate with you. Again, we've talked about celebration. I wanna celebrate with you. And so with heads bowed and eyes closed, in just a moment, I'm gonna count to three. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand high in the air. I wanna see it. We'll keep you there for just a moment and then we'll put it down and we'll all celebrate. But if today you would say, Pastor, I said yes to Jesus today, on the count of three, would you raise your hand high? One. Two, three. Just slip it up high right where you are. Just for a moment, I want to see it. Continue to keep it up. For, yeah, I see hands going up here in the center section. Hands back here to the right. Hands up in the balcony. While your hands are up, one of our team members is going to put a Connect card in your hand. So if you feel somebody put something in your hand, that's just our team. We want to give you a Connect card. Here's the reason why. Because your name matters to us. You are important, and we would love to walk with you and encourage you pray for you, and we can't do that if we don't know who you are. So in the moments that remain, if you'll take a second, you'll fill that out. Our campus pastors and hosts will tell you what to do with it. We got a cool gift we wanna give you. But more than anything, we wanna be able to celebrate your decision. So go ahead and put your hands down and across all campuses, you can open your eyes. Can we put our hands together? Can we celebrate together today? Come on, church.